Evening, everybody. Murderer's Row. Welcome, and thanks for coming. Um, there, is a, there is no shortage uh, in our uh, land today of people who have uh, views and are eager for you to, and are eager to share them with you about uh, subjects like uh, opioids and, and addiction, subjects like uh, vaping and organ transplantation and so forth. There is a shortage of people who have spent their careers uh, both in continuous medical practice, in this case psychiatry, and in uh, more or less continuous research including of the most basic kind. Our, our guest tonight qualifies on all those scores and many others. She's been a, a scholar, an author, uh, at Yale Medical School, and much more recently at, uh, at the American Enterprise Institute, and um, someone who has just finished uh, a full year in the epicenter of the opioid ep epidemic, both practicing her uh, medical craft and and studying and trying to learn about this uh, very important social phenomenon. So it's a great treat uh, to uh, bring uh, to Purdue someone I, I confess uh, to have had a great admiration and a friendship with for a long time. Please welcome uh, my friend, Dr. Sally Sattel. Well, Dr. Sattel. Um, you're not, you're a person I know that, uh, not prone to do this, but I'm going to insist that you talk just for a little bit about your personal background, which is an interesting one, and also uh, credentials and qualifies you to talk about the various subjects we're going to cover tonight. Okay, when people ask me that, I always think, well, what's the, what's the, the most meaningful beginning point? So I, I think I'll start with when I went, decided to go to... Um, Kindergarten. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> No, to medical school because I didn't, I was never a pre-med. I went to college at Cornell in the 70s and it was, um, it was brutal. I, um, it never occurred to me, frankly, to go to medical school and, and had it, I probably would have been discouraged by the just rapacious competition between those guys. And um, it was unpleasant. Anyway, so I went to the University of Chicago to um, be an evolutionary biologist because so I had this great romance, romantic idea about Darwinism, and, um, and I, I loved it there, but um, you know, it became clear to me that's probably not what I wanted to do, and you had to be so, so dedicated, because the chances are you would um, you know, end up in a very small college town, and I'm a big, I've grown up in New York, I've always lived in big cities except for last year, and um, I just knew that wasn't me, and I didn't love it enough, and mm -hmm. to devote your life to PhD work and then being an academic in that field, you just have to love it. So um, I love the University of Chicago, but as I said, I was starting to think maybe, maybe this isn't the right career path. And, and my department just happened to be in charge of teaching gross anatomy and histology and neuroanatomy to the medical students. So I had a lot of contact with them, and they weren't like the medical students at, at um, Cornell, they were medical, they were almost all from the Midwest. Most of them were either English or history majors or philosophy majors. I mean, they took, so, uh, they put medicine and, and their, frankly, I think they tended to see it as a calling, a lot of them more than as a profession, mm -hmm. which is how most of, a lot of the students at Cornell seem to see it. And, and, and they had a real background in the humanities and they were, they were inspiring. And I thought, well, maybe this is something you know I could do. And I remember um, running into one <coughs> guy who had done his psych uh, rotation, and he was telling me about a patient. And and um, you know, and I realized that probably more than any other area within medicine, um, psychiatry had, an, you know, it has an amazing scope. I mean, it can go from you can go from neurons to Shakespeare because you know, on the one hand, you're going from the brain, which is about mechanism, you know, all the way to the mind, which is about meaning, and it just seems so interesting. So, so I did apply to medical school, knowing I wanted to be a psychiatrist. Most people go to medical school, they're not quite sure what they want to be, but anyway, I knew that's what I wanted. So I went, and, um, and I graduated and did my residency at, uh, at Yale, and I stayed on the faculty, and I was at the VA, 
and the VA is an interesting institution. And, um, and one thing that, that jumped out at me was how well-meaning but dysfunctional their disability system was. And so this was now the early 90s. And um, we had a lot of Vietnam era and Vietnam vets. And a lot of these guys, and they were mostly men, you know, then, <clears throat> were probably highly rehabilitatable, but the disability system had kind of gotten a hold of them, told them that they had a condition, um, often post-traumatic stress disorder, that was disabling for life, mm -hmm. and that, frankly, everything that went wrong in their life from the time they came back was a product of their ex ex exposure to the, to the war. And remember, only 15% had been in combat, um, which is not to say that there weren't jobs, like truck drivers, and, you know, which were um, highly dangerous, but in terms of actual exposure to combat, it was, it was a minority. Um, and they, they were just fed this... Um, these, narrative. Pardon me? That's the hop word these days, narrative. Oh, yes. Um, that basically they were destroyed by their combat, mm -hmm. by their war experience. Mm -hmm. And so, sadly, some, some minority of people are, um, I'm not minimizing the, the intense trauma of the whole thing, but the good news is most people, uh, you know, can be rehabilitated and live productive lives, but not if you're caught at the most fragile point in your life, you know, when you've just come out of a situation, you haven't readjusted to civilian life, and it's like a moonshot. You know, if you're off a little bit when you mm -hmm. come back, if there's no intervention, you'll be out there drinking and beating your wife and not working, and it's a horrible situation. And um, we didn't catch people soon enough. We told them pretty early on, well, this is what happens, and here's your check. Well, and I... you're not going to get your check unless you manifest these symptoms. But we should have, plus, we're not even requiring treatment. I think that's still true in the VA, because mm -hmm. the, the Veterans Disability um, Agency is different from the Veterans Health Administration. And so, anyway, that was something very wrong there. So that got me thinking about policy issues. Um, and then we also, this is just a, a kind of a parallel thing. We all, there was also a program at the time that, um, uh, oh, and we also, okay, so I was running the drug treatment unit. Well, what happened when people got their checks? They spent it on drugs. And it was just completely undermining my work. And I realized that, you know, there's, there is clinical work to be done, but it was in the, you know, a larger framework of the way the, the policy structure and the incentive structure was there, and it was wrong. And so when this policy um, opportunity came up, this Robert Wood Johnson Health Policy Fellowship, which was really great, you go to D.C. for a year and work with a senator, mm -hmm. or, well, you work in the administration or in Congress, and did I did that. Did you ever that. return to Yale after that? Mm -mm. So that was where you I, branched I wanted off. to get out. Right. Um, well, um... <laughs> and they changed the fellowship program, after, not after me, but so many of us defected um, <laughs> that they now changed it because the expectation was that you'd go back and teach health policy. And to me, it was just regressive to go back. Although it was, I mean, it was wonderful. Yale yeah, was a great place, but you I wanted to move on. Down in New Haven after they've seen DC. Huh? Well, um, Potomac fever can be chronic, and it's true. So um, we know it's not how you spent your summer vacation, how you spend your last year. Tell us a little about the project you. Uh, immersed yourself in where you were and what you right. saw and did. Well, I may have mentioned I've, I've been working in methadone clinics for a long time. So, um, and then of course there, the the opioid. I'm I'm doing this crisis simply because the the words become a cliche. Not that it's not a crisis. Um, and uh, but so I felt I knew urban opioid crises. <laughs> We're not even a crisis. It's endemic at that point. Um, but but not Appalachian. And, you know, in our methadone clinic, almost all the patients started using drugs in the Carter administration. I mean, the average age is 57, and um, almost entirely African-American. Pills had nothing to do with anything. I mean, it was a co completely different narrative. And um, so, I, so I wanted to see, well, also, all you heard was, we don't have enough help, we don't have enough help. And so I had that waiver to do buprenorphine. And um, I thought, well, I, I can help. And I needed a vacation. I needed a sabbatical <laughs> from my sabbatical, which is what being at AEI feels like. And, um, 
So someone suggested I call J.D. Vance, who wrote Hillbilly Elegy, and just ask him if he could find me some place in Ohio. Um, and, and he found me this little town called Ironton, Ohio. <clears throat> and there's a door prize for anyone who's, <coughs> who's heard of it. Anyway, it's in the uh, southeastern corner. Um, so Ashland, West, Huntington, West Virginia, and Ironton. Ironton's the smallest of them. It's, it's 10,000, and I think Huntington is 50,000, and Ashland's about 20,000. And Huntington's the one that's been on the map a lot. And they have a really wonderful mayor, and they've really, they have made some progress there. But um, So that's where I went for a year, did some clinical work, you know, interviewed a lot of people, tried to get a, just tried to get a sense of the progression of the problem, what, you know, how a town responds to it. I'd never lived in a small town before, and so I'd never, I'd kind of never seen the connective tissue of a small place. Um, you know, in D.C., when you pass a store that's empty, you don't think twice. Well, there'll be something else in there. You don't think that a whole family's now decimated and... Um, and the people they employed and the, you know, mm -hmm. ripples that go outward and, you know, a town that has, is not that uncommon, sadly, I'm sure, but only 20% of people who pay taxes and um, cutting services and maybe won't have a fire department, you know, that kind of thing. And don't go to Walmarts, but go to this local place. It never occurred to me to buy local. Why would I buy local? Mm -hmm. I buy what I want. But no, it could help more people this way. And so I'm sure that's not as eye-opening for a lot of folks um, who are from smaller places, but it was, uh, that was different. And of course, everyone is intensely religious, and I'm an atheist Jew from New York. That's redundant, isn't it? And um, so, but I was so, um, my best friends uh, were, uh, one was a priest and two others uh, was a couple who were um, intensely Baptist, but I'm told that's redundant as well. And, and these were people who, um, you know, I mean, I've been to church more in one year than in my life. Mm -hmm. And um, they really um, were very devout people who, who were um, truly um, trying to emulate Jesus. I mean, they, mm -hmm. I, I remember we went in a, um, were in a driving to a, um, a restaurant. I, I was with the wife, and the husband was catching up. And he came, and he looked kind of shaken. And it turned out he was in a fender bender in the parking lot. And... Um, Anyway, apparently there was some damage to the car, but he was okay. But anyway, and then, of course, they say grace, you know, before. And he, so with the first thing out of his mouth is praying for the woman who hit him. You know, I hope mm. she's not too upset. Mm -hmm. I hope it doesn't cost them too much money. I hope, and I, I'm thinking, where I come from, my cousin Alan, who's a, you know, a union lawyer, would have been all with a neck brace, and maybe I can get some money out of it. <laughs> if that's what, yeah. I'll take some of this, you know. Yeah. I mean, I... I know they were still hoping they could make some inroads in terms of my belief system, and I'm pretty, you know, I, I found it, pretty immune, but it, it was a, so moving that they really, they, they truly cared about people so much. The famous historian Paul Kennedy and a couple of colleagues at Yale mm -hmm. had an interesting course, I wrote a column about it when I heard about it, where they, instead of a conventional senior or a, a capstone project, the student is, or a final exam, the student is allowed to, over the summer, given a stipend to go visit some place they'd never visited. His, uh, one of his students visited a place in Texas and had exactly that experience, no, no encounter before with the, uh, the uh, value that uh, faith can bring in the, in the lives of people who are in difficult situations. Yeah, well, and these, in fact, these particular people weren't. Mm -hmm. They were the helpers, so to speak. Yeah, and, yeah. But yeah, it was very, that was, that was very, you know, very in, in, inspiring. Well, and their attitude about, was great, too. I want to ask you about a, a addiction. I would, I'm going to do what our, our great alum, Brian Lamb, used to, oh, does to people all the time. Uh -huh. Done to me a few times. I'm going to read you something you wrote. Uh -huh. And uh, then I'll you can tell us. It. Yeah, yeah. Well, in, in, um, in a book you wrote, but uh, just before this uh, field trip, an extended field trip, you took exception with the idea that addiction is, some, is a, you said it's not a chronic condition for many of the people that, uh, that, are, uh, uh, that are using these substances. You said, it's impossible to understand addiction if one glosses over the reality that addicts do possess the capacity for choice and an understanding of consequences. The clinical reality is the most effective interventions aim not at the brain, but at the person. Would you talk about that? 
Uh, yeah, so I've always been critical of, gosh, back in 95 or something, um, the National Institute on Drug Abuse decided, it's funny, anytime you decide a clinical matter is something versus something else, mm -hmm. you have to wonder how socially constructed it is, um, that addiction was a brain disease. And I always thought, God, that is so weird. Um, and the risk of, of such a reductionistic definition is that you, know, you won't see the whole person. Um, certainly not arguing that the brain is involved, for heaven's sakes. Um, I wouldn't challenge anyone who gave an hour-long lecture about you know, how you know, all the neurotransmitters and the circuitry are, and we're still mapping that out, but um, involved, of course they're involved. Why would people take drugs if they weren't, if they didn't <laughs> operate on the reward centers and all this kind of thing? But it's just too narrow. It's like flattening people into a dopamine pancake. And um, <laughs> it doesn't acknowledge the fact that people use drugs for reasons. And that is critically important to helping people. I mean, there's a why here. And, the, and, and why doesn't make sense with most other, why did you get breast cancer? What, what kind of question is that? I don't know, bad genes? Maybe I was exposed to something environment? Bad luck, mutation, I, I don't know. You know, why does your thyroid, I don't know. Why do you use drugs? Oh, that's a, that's a question that, you know, makes sense. And um, so there's that, and you mentioned um, choice. Now, I don't mean choice as in, oh, just snap out of it. Um, although people do, and we as clinicians just don't see them, because obviously they haven't come to us. But, um, but the idea that, you know, through drug courts, which are diversionary, um, Mechanisms, uh, because I don't see why people would miss be incarcerated for even committing minor crimes, but, um, but it diverts people into to, um, treatment programs, and there's kind of a sanctions and reward system there that you do well. Um, you, you, you get less supervision, you get more freedom. Um, if you're having problems, well, they, they do supervise you more carefully. You know, some of it, um, I mean, it's, it's the spirit is not supposed to be punitive. It's supposed to be therapeutic, but there is a carrot and stick dimension to it. And the retention rates are better, uh, no surprise. They have leverage over you. Um, uh, but people often do better than they do in uh, re regular adjudication kinds of mechanisms. And there's a massive history on what's called uh, literature, I mean, on contingency management, which is rewarding people for clean, ur you know, clean urine screens and things like that. So. Um, in your clinical practice, what have been the most successful consequences or um, uh, uh, choices you have confronted people with? I'm sorry, I, I didn't quote well, you. Well, if you're question. trying to help somebody, uh -huh. and you, you, you pointed out that there are rewards or there oh, are yeah. consequences, uh, what, which ones, and you chronicled some in your, in your oh, books. Oh, which ones but, are? Yeah, well, which some ones? of them are actually very, um, um, some are very, um, I mean, they're simply things, like little vouchers that you mm -hmm. can give people for um, product, you know, to go to Walmarts or movie theaters or stuff. But that, that adds up, and it's not easy for a standard, you know, for a non-research setting to do that. Now, in methadone clinics, we kind of have a built-in leverage because we can give people more or less bottles to take mm -hmm. home, and that's, they don't have to come in as often. Um, but, the, but the idea that, um, you know, people... If we call it a brain disease, then it puts it on a par with, um, you know, Parkinson's or Alzheimer's. And as you know, an analogy I like to use is if you confronted an, a person with a person with Alzheimer's, admittedly, while he could he or she could still understand your proposition, and said, you know, I'm going to give you a million dollars if your memory doesn't deteriorate any further, or <laughs> shoot your dog if it does. That's a meaningless proposition because even though there are brain changes in addiction, they're not the same kind of brain changes in a, a condition like Alzheimer's, which makes the person impervious to these kinds of contingencies. And we can take advantage of that. Um, and I mentioned um, people using drugs for, for reasons and, and why, how, how important that is. And if I can go back a little bit, though, I feel I gave a little bit short shrift to um, Ohio is, um, you know, one thing that really solidified for me is, is this idea that we don't, pay enough, we don't pay enough attention to the distinction between what I would call individual versus communal addiction. Um, I mean, the kind of people that, you know, you would treat in kind of an upscale um, 
psychiatric practice or, God forbid, you know, a family member um, who kind of had everything. Well, the parents were fine parents, you know, went to a good college, um, had everything given to him or her, but, you know, for whatever reason became involved in drugs. Um, you know, you often find when you scratch the surface, even if things always looked great, even if the person was the president of, you know, the class and the captain of the football team and the prom queen, that for whatever reason, with all the advantages, he or she just always felt, what, either terrible about herself, um, either incredibly socially uncomfortable, just, for, just with dealing with some sort of inner turmoil. And, and drugs in the short term are very, can be very, and alcohol, you know, can be very helpful with that kind of thing. But that's an individual problem. That's mm -hmm. kind of has a psychological basis. And, um, and that's, you know, again, what in a way, you know, when you're a psychiatrist, clearly you're dealing with the individual um, always. But, um, but that's kind of a different picture than when you have whole communities that are using drugs because, it, it, you know, when you have the case, the classic case of, like, the individual who appears to have everything using drugs, then it's the drug. I always think of drug use. I don't even call it a disease. To me, it's a symptom of something that's... Mm -hmm. derailed, dislocated within the person. But when you have a whole community, then that's a reflection of a sick community. And um, solutions are somewhat different. And, and often out of our control, because I'm not going to be able to bring jobs in as a psychiatrist, right. but you know, they're more, sometimes they're structural. Your books and articles are really readable, uh, but they're very data rich. And um, uh, one area that you, you documented uh, opened my eyes about uh, a lot, had to do with the percent of today's opioid uh, users who have been longtime users of yeah. other things. In other words, you've taken, I think, some exception to this idea this was all sort of inflicted on a lot of people by nefarious uh, marketers and drug companies and so forth, that it just came out of nowhere um, as a, some, some sort of conspiracy. Right, well, the data um, show very clearly that um, most people who abused um, prescription pills were never prescribed those pills in the first place and, and give people the citations for that. And that within the, within the pool of people who are prescribed and develop problems, um, these are folks who either had a drug or alcohol problem before or are struggling with some sort of, um, and not even necessarily a psychiatric mm -hmm problem, although it, depression and anxiety, um, but, you know, some sort of profound demoralization or some sort of existential problem. And, I mean, one example is, gave earlier is, um, I mean, so, um, you know, the stories you read in the media, they're not always this cut and dried. You know, everything was great until my doctor prescribed, well, when you dig past it, things weren't so great. Now, an example where things Pretty, were pretty great, but completely went off the rails, is something like this, where you have, you know, it's frequently a young person, but um, who, uh, is, let's say, going off to college. Um, so I actually met this guy who had a, had a um, fellowship, scholarship to Ohio State for football, and he was great. And he knew it was a long shot that he'd probably end up being an accountant, but maybe he actually could be in the NFL. And that, you know, he was really psyched. And, and his senior year, he got in a car accident, and um, you know, it really messed up his his throwing arm, and basically, it ruined his dream. And so he was prescribed, you know, opioids for the pain of his accident. But then he became addicted to them, and he became addicted to them because his life was ruined. Um, it really wasn't. I mean, of course, he ended up going, you know, could, could go on and lead a very, you know, productive life, but his vision for himself at the time, and it's obviously devastating to a young person when your whole identity is formed around mm. um, a certain kind of future and it takes a long time to recalibrate. And, um, and, but that's why he became addicted. I mean, there's a deeper story. Mm -hmm. It's not what I call the tubercular model of addiction. You know, you're around drugs and you catch it. It's, <laughs> it's never that easy. And that's, again, sometimes how it's, how it's portrayed. And all this has incredible, you know, clinical implications. 
We, uh, in the, we'll, we, we'll uh, reserve the last uh, several minutes for questions uh, from students or others, and they may want to come back to addiction, sure. probably will. But you've covered a lot of other ground, and I want to expose the, the audience to a little bit of it if we can. Sure. So in a, in a fascinating book uh, that's been out two or three years, uh, uh, I love the title, and you say you don't, mm -hmm. Brainwashed. Like um, you uh, it, uh, uh, challenged um, a lot of the, uh, uh, what you see is overclaiming or overhyping around brain scanning and so forth, what, what we can learn from what, the, uh, what parts of the brain light up at uh, given different stimuli and so forth. So um, uh, there are some fascinating chapters. I'd like to ask you to just say a word about each of three of them. The first was neuromarketing. Uh, first tell the audience what it is and why you think maybe it's uh, been oversold so far. Well, that's apparently basically a scam. Um, but, <laughs> but the book is not about neuro. I mean, I worship neuroscientists. I mean, they are the smartest. They're brilliant, and their work is fantastic. And the technology is out of space marvels. I mean, it's, it's incredible. So none of this is a critique of their work or of you know, serious scientists. It's, the critique was of, um, to the extent to which these, um, or the fruits of these technologies is brought into the public square. I mean, and it doesn't hold up um, yet in um, making a lot of these claims. Mm -hmm. So for example, and I have to be honest, this lighting up is, I started writing this in 2008 and uh, with my colleague, Scott Lillianfeld, who's a brilliant psychologist at Emory, and um, and that was when uh, I remember that the science section of the Times and everywhere we'd see this is your brain on this, and this is the love section, and this is the hate <laughs> section. This is the, I mean, it's, it's re utterly ridiculous. And to be honest, that's that's largely stopped. Mm -hmm. I'd like to take credit for it, but um, and now. You don't even really hear about that much. The people more, who said that they could sell your products yeah, for you if you would just up. let them uh, measure. It, uh, that's ridiculous. Yeah. Um, and they still have the, uh, I mean, it's amazing how well these books do as business books. Um, but, I mean, they're all, I think a lot of these people in marketing are always looking for some sort of, you know, quick formula. But, yeah, the predictive um, value of this is, is, is very low. What about the, va what about the uh, uh, value or efficacy of brain uh, scanning for lie detection? You know, that's probably the one area where there is some, I don't want to say real promise, but um, uh, put it this way, in, in, in laboratory settings, and they're highly controlled and often pretty, um, I mean, they're, these are lies that are in the context of, um, for example, did did um, did, a, did the subject put a, an object in this closet or that closet? And they can actually tell with I think fairly better than average. Um, better than a polygraph, maybe. Oh well, those are known to be unreliable because they measure. Um, you know, galvanic skin response and other measures of arousal, which can be just as high if you're innocent. I don't want to be accused of this, you know. Um, well, probably worse. And if you're a very practiced liar, you'll probably, you know, mm -hmm. stay five. But um, so, I mean, it's, 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 it's interesting that they might be able to tell with, you know, greater than choice um, accuracy uh, which closet you did put the watch in, but, you know, how relevant that becomes. So it's, so it's interesting in a, in a, on a small-scale level. And then you have to think, well, what is a level of accuracy that's acceptable anyway um, mm -hmm. in a legal setting? I mean, I don't have the answer. Is it should it be 99 percent? Should it be 90? We're so bad at it anyway. And, um, you know, as, as you know, we're not good at pe – humans are notoriously bad at detecting lies. So th that's – that's why there was even an, an interest in trying to mechanize this in some way. So, I mean, right now it's in a heuristic phase, but it, it might develop, who knows. Um, the part that I always found um, more intriguing, well, there is a chapter on addiction, of course. It, it's um, trying to go beyond the brain. I mean, it's just one level, it's just one explanatory level. There's um, a psychological explanatory level of addiction and a behavioral and a, a cultural and a sociological. And, they're not mutually exclusive, and some may be more relevant in, to some people, and others are more relevant to the same person at other times in their life. But, um, but to just privilege the neurobiological, why would you do that? You miss so much information. Um, and then there's a chapter on free will, which I figured out. 
Um, <laughs> I haven't. But uh, this idea that, um, uh, well, that trans that, in a way that transcends brains, because that's a philosophical problem. That's really the issue. Yeah, but it there is, is you, you documented how it's creeping in, not creeping in, it's barged into courtrooms and into the law as a exculpatory, uh, well, that, you know, uh, uh, under the guise of neuroscience. That's different than the free will. I love the title of that chapter, it was My Amygdala Made Me Do It. Oh, right. right? Um, yeah, that's a little different from the, 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 the one chapter is on free will in, in a more philosophical sense. Um, which again, I, I, I can't add to. I can only tell you that brain science can't resolve that because that's a philosophical question, whether we have free will, because you decide effectively what counts as free will. I mean, I guess I'm a, well, I get, technically, I guess I would be a compatibilist, but you know, there is a big level of determinism, but as long as people can um, plan, can change their mind based on new information, then they've got enough free will. Bringing scans into courtroom is to show that this person's brain is damaged in a way where they can't even plan, or, or their, their um, capacity to control their impulses is so impaired that they can't. So it's out of, philosoph out of the realm of philosophy and more in the realm of neurology, and, um, and that's true. Some people can't. Some people do have such severe brain damage they can't, but those are... You know, there's usually an accident associated with it, and they're a little more straightforward. It's when you get into situations where, um, you know, people commit horrible crimes, and um, for whatever reason, and um, and this is just an effort to mitigate the, you know, the punishment to make it seem as if they couldn't do otherwise. But the brain scan cannot show us that. It can't. They can't. I'll say yet, because who knows what we'll discover. But it cannot distinguish. Impulses that are irresistible from those that were not resisted. You said that um, before we leave this, I just want to venture an observation. Uh, you said that, that perhaps unlike the, its use in the courts, mm -hmm. where as far as I know, it's continuing to be employed. Yeah, it's not working that well, luckily. That's sort of the question I was headed for, because in the neural marketing sense, there's a market test at some point. If people discover that it's not helping me sell the product, mm -hmm. it's, it's a scam or yeah. something close, they quit buying it. There's a control mechanism that may not be there in the purely I, legal setting. I think judges are becoming more skeptical. Uh -huh. Luckily, there's a lot of judicial education, um, and luckily a lot of it's taught by my <laughs> friend Stephen Morris at the University of Pennsylvania, who is a law professor, and this is one of his people who specialize in neural law. Um, are often on the more skeptical side uh -huh. of things. So that's one nice um, sort of check on all this. And, um, and I think juries, you know, I, I think juries tend to, when, unless it's a corporation, they, they want to hold people accountable. Mm -hmm. so, um, so it hasn't seemed to have run away and poisoned the system. But you know, that, as I said, we wrote that in, well, we started writing it in 2008. And I think a lot of the enthusiasm it's how many, well, it's 11 years well, later. A, yeah, that's, that's one nice story, <laughs> I think. Good. Um, uh, so let's uh, change subjects sure. um, uh, rather uh, uh, abruptly here. Uh, you've had some interesting comments about the, the whole matter of vaping. Uh, and uh, why don't you share a little bit of that with us? Well, the vaping situation, you know, was different a year ago than it is now. I mean, it... When I first started following vaping in 2014, um, there was, my impression was that just in articles you read, just in a, a kind of atmospheric way, there was sort of, oh yeah, oh, maybe, that, maybe that's great you know, for smokers. And of course it simply is a, you know, a, a manifestation of this classic public health strategy, which is harm reduction, which is in this, this case either tobacco or nicotine harm reduction, which but I should really be tobacco harm reduction in a sense, because nicotine itself is fairly innocuous in otherwise healthy people, um, which isn't to say it isn't addictive, but in terms of creating health problems. Um, not for everybody, you know, pregnant people shouldn't smoke and or even, although they OBGYNs will use patches all the time for women who don't want to, you know, who won't stop. But, um, but from four, 19, about 2014 onward, there was, you know, a growing, um, 
I don't know, it's not really an industry, but it, there was a growing uh, sort of a constant drumbeat of, of, of detraction from, from vaping. Uh, and, and much of it, I'm sorry to say, I think was perpetuated by the Centers for Disease Control. Um, it was only seen in, um, through the commissioner's eyes at the t or the director's eyes as a big threat to kids. It was going to lead kids to, it was going to renormalize smoking and be a gateway to smoking. And I'm not saying that was not a, you know, a legitimate concern to have. I mean, it's an empirical matter. Is that going to happen or isn't it going to happen? And it was clear it wasn't happening. Smoking in kids had, has been going down for, for decades and even became steeper once e-cigarettes became available. So you could much more persuasively make a case for e-cigarettes being a ramp off smoking for kids than introducing kids to smoking, although let me please stipulate teens who do not smoke should not vape. But, um, but that never became clear, and yet, again, it just those warnings and that it caused um, popcorn lung, I don't know if you've heard of this, but it, which is a very dangerous pulmonary condition. There's not been one recorded case of that um, where nicotine causes cancer, um, I mean, all these, the American Lung Association, all, I mean, people and institutions you would otherwise want to respect were just giving out false information. Um, there, we don't know anything about them. That's, that's ridiculous. We know, now we don't have, obviously, d decades of data because they haven't been around that long. And I'm not saying they're safe, but the point is they are much safer than than smoking, they emit um, the aerosol in e-cigarettes, which has nicotine in it, propylene glycol, vegetable glycerin, flavoring, and oh, I think I said nicotine. Um, I don't know what years of inhaling propylene glycol will do. I mean, it's in asthma inhalers, but, uh, but again, you're vaping constantly. You're not using your asthma inhaler constantly. Um, and uh, we don't know what long-term will do, but we every reason to think it will be a lot less problematic than smoking for all those years. And, um, and I think I said this, but the, the, um, the number of, of toxins slash carcinogens emitted in e-cigarette vapors are many fewer than in, in cigarette smoke, and that's the whole key, is to take the smoke and keep the nicotine. That's the harm reduction part. And um, many fewer of the, I, I mean, as I said many fewer, and at much lower levels, but not at zero. And that's why we don't know what's going to happen. And, and if you don't smoke, you shouldn't start to vape. But none of that was ever at the forefront. And all you had to do is look at the UK um, and England, where they are so progressive on this matter. Their, their equivalent of the CDC, the Public Health Service, was always promoting vaping. The Royal College of Physicians, um, uh, estimated that it's 95% safer than smoking, or 95% less dangerous, I guess I should say. Um, maybe it's 80, um, but they measured it based on those toxins that mm -hmm. I mentioned, 95% fewer. But, and, um, and their National Health Service, they sell vaping, they have vaping stores in their hospitals. I mean, they are just a mirror image of, of us. And... Um, Maybe that's one upside to a socialized medical system is they want to save all this money, so they're promoting it. Um, <coughs> no, there isn't enough. Anyway, um, but it's, it's fascinating to, to see how we've responded so differently. Americans have a, we put much more emphasis um, on, uh, much more anxiety, I should say, on um, teenage, on youth than they do. Not that they want their kids in any danger at all, but their trade-offs are different. So in other words, um, how much emphasis do we put on, on perceived or speculative harms to kids versus known advantages to adults? And we just, we weigh that differently. Um, plus, there is this long history of... Um, I mean, e-cigarettes were given the worst name possible in retrospect. Mm -hmm. they, were, they were named to appeal to smokers. Oh, a different kind of cigarette. Um, great, and this one will be less dangerous for me. But a lot of the tobacco control people who've been fighting big tobacco and smoking, which is the right, you know, smoking is the right enemy uh, for all these years, all they heard was cigarette. And so that just immediate flashbacks to the 50s and 60s when the big tobacco companies were pushing reduced tar, you know, filters and reduced tar 
um, and nicotine cigarettes as safer, but they, they were never safer. So it looked like, oh, we're being sold another bill of goods, plus there was a lot of confusion over the degree to which big tobacco was invested in this industry is a minor part of it. Um, up until last year when um, Altria invested in Juul, about 35%, and even that still makes independent vaping stores and vaping companies the majority, but it still was a pretty, I mean, mm. a massive stake in it, no question. But again, because it seemed like a product, again, of big tobacco, of course it couldn't be trusted. And then when you hear nicotine, I mean, the two words together, nicotine addiction, scare the hell out of people. But, you know, in this world of harm reduction, which is basically everything, which is needle exchange, you know, we don't have any problem giving methadone to heroin addicts, but why do we have trouble giving nicotine in an inhaled form to nicotine addicts, mm -hmm. you know? Um, it's a real interesting double standard, but much of it's, I think, caught up with um, this confusion about how involved this traditional you know, mm -hmm. enemy has been, and, um, and also misunderstandings about nicotine. Again, it's relatively benign in adults. And, um, so, and then, uh, then this misinformation cascade just developed, and I don't blame the average person for, th in fact, polls, or, polls show taken over time that people are much more sus suspicious of e-cigarettes now and more than half think they're as dangerous or more dangerous than smoking. And these vaping bans now, excuse me, the flavor bans, are just going to push, I mean, what do you think happens with prohibition? It's just going to push more people back to smoking or to bootleg um, flavored vapes. And we've seen what uh, black market um, products do because that's, those are the folks who are dying from this, you know, lung problem, and these folks who are getting sick. And I think the first case has appeared maybe the late spring, and now this, it's up to about 1,600 people who've developed these pulmonary illnesses and maybe under 40 have died. But that's being blamed on vaping. Well, vaping, you know, is just a delivery system. You can vape commercial regulated quality nicotine, or you can vape black market contaminated um, THC, and that's what's accounted for, you know, um, the vast majority of these deaths. I mean, I'll just say one more thing, but I mean, think about it, vaping products, which are all regulated by the FDA, they're not approved yet, but they're all regulated. All their flavors and all their devices have to be um, registered with the FDA, which they are. Um, I mean, yeah, registered. They, um, these have been around for five, 10 years. All of a sudden, people are getting sick. I mean, that has the hallmarks of a, acute contamination, mm -hmm. you know? And it's been such a, such a dangerous thing to have conflated vaping of, again, legitimate commercial e-cigarettes with black market THC. So it's not a story about vaping, it's not a story about e-cigarettes, it's a story about black markets. And it's gotten very confused. People have started smoking again, and people who've, who you know, like to use THC, they're misled into thinking, well, this isn't a problem of what I'm doing. So mm -hmm. people who like both nicotine and THC are disadvantaged by this miscommunication. We're gonna go to audience questions. I hope students will beat their elders to the mic microphone, but it's first come, first serve. Gonna do that in just a minute, but uh, well, you go ahead and claim a spot. <laughs> but just in case that wasn't contrarian enough for anybody. Oh, we can talk about organ sales. Too. That's next. <laughs> let's let's just do a little bit, and and Sally, you should you should uh, tell them that this is not purely an academic matter with you. But what 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 about uh, what are your views, which are um, uh, uh, somewhat unorthodox, on uh, organ transplantation and sales? Yeah, uh, well, I, um, I've come to this issue it, 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 truly organically in, in um, having had a, um, had a kidney, actually two kidney transplants. Um, don't know why, I don't have diabetes or any collagen vascular disease or um, the classic um, kinds of problems. But so um, anyway, uh, thank God um, I found um, donors twice, and I'm very good to my interns because you never know there may be another time. But um, one's a very one's a close friend, and another tremendous author. Yeah, Virginia uh, Pastrell. Yeah. Who hopefully one day you can you can hear from her. Um, 
So I was lucky uh, that I did find um, you know, a donor and then, an, and then another one. But, um, but so many people don't. And um, you know, about 12 people tomorrow will be dead because nobody gave them a kidney or they couldn't outlast the waiting list, which has, ironically, now it has about a little under 100,000 people waiting for organs, uh, for kidneys, about 120,000 waiting for all organs. But um, the re it was over 100,000 a few years ago, and, and this, is, this, this doesn't sound perverse. The reason fewer people are waiting is because of all the overdoses. They were able to transplant a lot of the kidneys from people who died from opioid overdoses. But in any case, um, you know, it's only going to get, this is only going to get worse. That's, that's the trend, more people needing organs all the time. And in 20 years, 30 years, if we're sitting here, It'll, we won't be talking about people donating organs because we'll have, be growing them in pigs or we'll have microdialysis filters and, um, or um, printed organs. I mean, there's no question technology is going to change this. Um, your grandkids or great-grandkids or whatever are going to think, it's barbaric, you had to get a kidney from a person? <laughs> That's not going to be the case in 50 years, I'm positive. But it's the case now, and a lot of people are dying unnecessarily because of a shortage. So why not give people a massive tax credit, um, a tuition voucher, a contribution to their 401k, um, money they can give to a charity if they're willing to give a kidney to save someone's life. You know, we're not talking about a classic free market where there's bidding or, um, you know, there can be, I don't know, all kinds of, I suppose, corrupt practices. Um, this is, you know, a third party which would either be the feds or some sort of sanctioned entity, you know, would just, would just, be, would just be there um, to recruit people if they're interested, you know, and, and they're healthy, and of course they would go through all the testing. It would be no different than the current system. You know, you could go to the UI hospital right now and say, I'd like to give a kidney to a stranger, and they put you through a lot of testing, uh, medical, of course, and um, to protect you and, and the potential donor. And you'll meet with a psychologist or a social worker to make sure you're, um, you know, it's not a Jodie Foster situation where you think if you give a kidney, you know, someone's going to fall in love with you or something like that, Hinkley, John Hinkley thing, you know. I mean, that your expectations are realistic, you understand the risks, this kind of thing. Um, the only difference is you, you, would, you would get something in return for saving someone's life. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, of course, altruistic um, donation, like, like I had, would continue to go on. I mean, many people, I mean, God forbid your, your relative has pancreatic cancer, you know. Oh, my God, what the world could you do? If your relative needs a kidney, you could, if you're healthy enough, give it to him or her. So that's pretty much that idea. And you know what? It's not that radical. Um, I'm not the first person to come up with it, God knows. In fact, it was first discussed in the 60s. The first kidney transplant was 1954, I think, or 53, 53, but to an identical twin because there was no immunologic <clears throat> you know, matching then, um, as, or the, um, I should say, the immunosuppressive regimes were not well developed and were pretty, pretty brutal still up until the 90s, even though 84 was a big jump with cyclosporin. And, um, and, uh, but this has always been an issue, and, and Al Gore, who at the time was in the House in 1984, he was the, he spearheaded the National Organ Transplant Act, which really made a whole system out of the organ procurement and distribution system. But at the last minute, he put in Section 301, which made it a felony to receive or give anything of material um, value for an organ. And that was because he didn't want to see um, basically a, um, you know, a free market. But he did say, if this doesn't work, we'll have to move to incentives. And no one ever tried to get him to reiterate mm -hmm. that. You know, I think he didn't want to revisit the issue. But, um, but the idea's been around for a long time that, well, why can't we incentivize people to donate? You know, what are you afraid of? What are you afraid of? You're afraid of Basically, people doing something they're going to regret afterwards. Not it, impulsively acting, maybe a poor, desperate person impulsively acting to do this and then regret it afterwards. Um, and, um, and we can protect all that mm -hmm. by not giving what desperate, impulsive people want, which is immediate cash. 
So you build in a waiting period of at least a year, and you don't give cash. You give, um, I mean, my specific plan happens to be a, um, a tax credit, or a fundable tax credit of 5000 a year for 10 years. Somehow everyone seems to intuitively think 50000 is the right value. Um, you can but, give drugs. <laughs> no, I guess that's a bad idea. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and, uh, and you know what? Um, the thing is, I've looked at, there have been a number of polls and surveys done on this, and I mean, I don't know what people think, and when I do lecture on it, I always sort of do a before and after poll, you know, what do pe people think about this mm -hmm. idea before and after, and usually, usually most people are receptive to it, unless they're bioethicists, and then um, afterwards, even more people are receptive to it, but, um, but in these polls, the average person in the very receptive to it. Um, they don't like the idea of a market market, you know, mm -hmm. or me giving you cash because they're afraid of, well, then only people who could afford it mm -hmm. would be able to engage in this kind of exchange. Now, you could argue that would still benefit others because they, the, it would get, get people off the list who had, um, you know, people, everyone mm -hmm. would move up. But, you know, there's something unsettling about rich people buying their, even though they, we do it every, they, we, I'm not one of them, do it all the time. But, um, still, you know, I, I, I'm sympathetic to that, and that's why a third party arrangement would obviate that issue of only, it, this way everybody who's as poor or rich as anything could, could benefit okay. this. So again, you don't give the cash, you don't give it right away, and, um, and then some people say, well, only minor poor minorities will be interested in this. I, I, that's an empirical matter. I am to think graduate students are the ones who are going to do it. <laughs> but. Um, but, we may have know, a graduate student waiting with a question here, so let's take it if oh, we okay. can, right over well, here. Well, I can't have an answer yeah. to that particular yeah. objection, but I guess we can wait. Hi, I'm Megan. I'm a pharmacy student, yeah. and I just wanted to ask. Um, so we talked. We talked in the Q and A session this afternoon, and also a little bit, a little bit about disability. And I was just wondering. I guess since we know that like that system was a little broken, what kind of social services, um, as far as like addiction, um, recovery and treatment, like should we take model after like the way Sweden does it? Cause they seem to do pretty well, but not everybody gets treated. But so I guess what in your eyes is a good way of going about that? Um, well, I mean, we, we know how to do pretty good drug treatment. It's just that the workforce is, this is to, um, is not robust enough to deliver it. And, um, and there are a lot of shoddy treatment programs. So that means two problems, that the standards aren't high enough in some of these programs and, and there aren't enough people to, to deliver it. So I don't think it's so much that it's, it's rocket science about how we should be treating folks. Um, uh, I, think, I think people should have a choice. Not everybody, if you're talking about opioids, which is the only thing we actually have any meaningful drug treatment, drugs for pharmaceutical treatments for, um, but uh, not everyone, some people can be in, you know, drug-free settings. I'd like to give people, a, you know, certainly a choice. Um, again, I, I think, you know, there are, lot, SAMHSA has a great manual on, you know, how to deliver treatment. You gotta follow people for a long time. This is not something that, um, you know, you treat in your 28 days and you're done with, but, um, uh, so that infrastructure is a, is a big problem, and, and that gets back to funding. And, um, and when folks live in, you know, communities that are, you know, really distressed, then it's, it's challenging because, you know, you can treat people, but um, if, they, if they go back to situations that they perceive as being, um, that are very stressful or don't offer opportunity, it's, it's, it's a bit of a setback. So... Um, so there's just a lot of rehabilitation involved, and I don't think maybe we put enough emphasis on that end of things. But um, I, I think this—I th I think all the ideas are, are fine. I just—I think I, again, I don't just think the implementation is, is suffering. Did, did you have something else in mind? Um, no? no, just uh, that like the way that it works in Sweden. Obviously, mm -hmm. they have socialized health care, so you have to apply and then your local welfare board okays your treatment and then they pay for you to be sent. And I guess I was thinking more about like payment and social services in the, like, cause we had talked again about um, disability. So money coming from uh, those avenues, I guess was more of what I was curious about. 
Well, I think Medicaid expansion is really, I mean, I, I, I know that probably upsets you, but um, <laughs> it's been, uh, it's, it's, it's really been helpful in this regard. Um, so we're paying for it. Uh, so, yeah, I, I don't know enough about what goes on in Sweden. I mean, everything in Sweden is hard to, <laughs> a lot of it's hard to generalize. You know, it's a more, um, it's such a more homogeneous population. I, I don't mean you shouldn't do, look at cross-cultural things, but it, it, it's always a challenge on what you can extrapolate from and what you can't. But in any, in any case, I, I think I'm going to stick with what I said before, which is, you know, we kind of know what to do. And, and in places with Medicaid expansion, there seems to be, you know, coverage for it. But... It's a lot of it's quality control and more people to do it. So. Thank you. And there's a question behind. All right, well, I'm just going <laughs> to come up here. Um, hi, my name is Fatima. I'm also a pharmacy student. I was curious, how do you feel that people that struggle with chronic pain are sort of affected by the recent changes in opioid prescribing habits? Yeah, I think that's one of the massive un unintended consequences of... Uh, cutting down on prescribing, which had to be done. I mean, doctors were way too profligate with the, the medications, and I'm talking about for acute pain, for sure. Very, you know, some people need 30 pills, but I mean, excuse me, 30 days worth. But most people don't. Um, most people um, don't even. Fi I mean, they're, they're, there's data on this. They don't even finish the pres prescription, and um, and then unfortunately, it will go in a medicine chest and. You know, then those get diverted. But uh, so there was definitely, an, a, definitely an important um, reason for doctors to become much more conscious of prescribing. And can I just interject sure. a question? Some have said that the reimbursement system incentivized doctors to give thirty days because they weren't going to get paid for if the if the patient came back. Is that? Oh, no, I think the surgeons didn't want the people to come back. Like, no, don't bother me here. You know, I'm no, I'm sorry. That's the point that some of us were making. Oh, I just think they honestly don't, didn't want to be, if anything, mm -hmm. they, oh, they wouldn't pay for it. I don't know about that. I thought mm -hmm. you were going to say that, that Medicaid paid for, covered all these medications. Like people went oh, to pill mills too. and stuff yeah, yeah. like that. Okay. So that's the other side of the expansion. But, um, uh, no, what's happened, though, to chronic patients is, I mean, let me back up, even in the acute phase, I think, and there's a lot of variation by state, but um, some places require the patient to come back after several days, and when you're in a rural area, to come back, and you just had surgery, it's outrageous mm -hmm. in, in position. So I don't necessarily mind the limits. I mean, I do mind it, because I'm big on physician autonomy, but... Um, but I understand why, you know, they built in these seven-day limits, but then make it easier to refill it. It mm -hmm. shouldn't be a burden to re have it refilled and for someone else to show up at the pharmacy, um, you know, maybe with the person's ID, but, you know, I'm here for my spouse to pick this up or my friend. Um, but it's the folks who are on, uh, the legacy patients, these folks who are on these, you know, high-dose opioids for a long time, you know, to be fair, uh, some percentage of them, when they first developed these, and we're talking intractable, horrible, imagine the worst headache you ever had, multiply it by 100 and have it every day of your life pain. Um, you know, maybe when they first developed these syndromes, they could have been managed differently. And today they probably would, but they, but they weren't. And so they're on you know, fentanyl patches and Oxycontin and Percocets for breakthrough pain and all this stuff. And and, you know, for a lot of them, it worked. It's working. And it makes the difference between anything from between being bedridden to getting out of bed and going to the bathroom and going into the kitchen to being bedridden and being a doctor. I can't tell you how many doctors have been taken off their medication. And I work with a, this genius woman who's... Um, is she's like a, like an underground railroad for pain patients. You can kind of find them some doctor who's more enlightened, but um, it's a horrible situation. Another colleague is keeping a, a registry of people who've killed themselves because doctors are and the doctors are scared. Um, the DEA it, it seems capricious at times. Other obviously it should have definitely raided pill mills, um, but other times it's not clear um, who 
whose door they're going to knock on. And with so many doctors who are afraid, you get one brave guy in town who's going to treat all the difficult people. So of course he's writing the high prescriptions, and then he calls attention to himself. And mm -hmm. um, it's a terrible problem. We were much too, I think, you know, blunt with these interventions. And um, we have a terrible problem, which is we're running out of time. Oh. But there's oh. one more. Uh oh, more than one. You guys want to flip for it? We'll try to be quick with the question and the answer. Sure. Yeah. Um, so you talked at the beginning about um, kind of communal addiction, like the addiction of an entire community. Yeah. Uh, so I was wondering, could you uh, identify maybe some of the causes that you see for that and any, I don't know, favorite policies that you have that address those causes? Um, that's, there's no short answer to that one, but um, well, basically, just this is almost an, an obscene abbreviation. But like this town I, w I was in, you know, it wasn't like Janesville, Ohio, or something where Wisconsin, right? Um, yeah. Where the GM plant or they yeah, just, yeah. you know, overnight drops off the face of the earth. I mean, this was like many places a more gradual um, evacuation of, of, of industry, you know, starting in the late '60s. Um, and then going on and on and on until, because Ironton was an iron town. And, um, and so, you know, I think economic problems did, did kick, kick this off, where, you know, unemployment and then men, you know, lose their, I mean, it's, it's totally dislocating to not have a job on every, so many levels. And, and that led to, you know, family dysfunction and more drinking and, and now you've got generations and generations. So whereas for that one, maybe for that first, when it first started happening, economic revitalization would have been completely enough. And now, the, you know, bringing back jobs, and there are, there are jobs in these places, but they're not well-paying jobs. Right. Um, and all the promising kids leave, and you're left with the addicted people and the old people. And you've kind of hollowed out your middle class. but. Um, uh, but now you've got, when it's multi-generational, um, then you've got problems of growing up in communities and families where men don't work or right. women don't work. And that's, um, that's pernicious uh, in, in terms of everything. I mean, if, especially when their adults are addicted, they're not paying attention to the, to the kids, they're not setting examples for internalizing discipline and schedule and routine and accountability. And, um, and it all just you know, it's, yeah. it's just an accumulation to the point where we've had patients who, the, the idea of, for some of them, of, I mean, some work really hard, but the idea of, you know, working and that kind of accountability is almost, you know, a foreign idea. Mm -hmm. And if you can get disability instead for anything, let's, let's do that, or an entitlement. And, and, you know, in some ways, being a clinician, I can talk much more easily about this than a policymaker, because I can tell you that working is the best therapy. It's mm -hmm. not because it's not because it's better for society. It's the best therapy for you to be busy, to have a structured day, to have interaction with people, to have a sense of purpose. And, yeah. Um, yep. So it's easy for me to say it because it's clinically indicated. How about one more while we're while we're breaking the time? Thank let's you, do it. When you talk about um, cost-effective long-term care, can you speak to the importance of? non-clinical recovery support services, and in particular, have you seen a growth around the country of recovery mutual aid societies that are more accepting of medication-assisted treatment? Oh, yeah, definitely. You know, there's a great guy, William White. Does that name ring a bell to you? Yes, Is it? Uh, oh, do you? Do you? Okay. Well, if you ever want to know anything about the history of recovery, the status of recovery, um, uh, or movements, he's he's the one to go to. And anyway, so yes, there's much more acceptance. I mean, I think um, things like AA and and um, are great and for whom they work. Obviously, um, people should try different AAs. They all have different personalities. Um, and uh, I mean, again, the medication part. I mean, if you think of recovery on a continuum. I mean, the most downstream thing is reviving somebody, so that's with Narcan. And it gets less pharmacologic as you go, go down or go out. And, and yes, there is the drug treatment to stabilize people, because that's what methadone and buprenorphine do. They stabilize people. They rarely enough. And then you get into the psychological and behavioral therapies of relapse prevention and, and then, you know, uh, 
vocational rehab and all this. And then depending on what the person's needs are, you know, how do you cope in this world? Some people are responding to d deprivation and some people are responding more to, you know, deficits in themselves. They don't know how to manage. Mm -hmm. and, and being in a community of people who are recovered, hopefully they have various stages, so they have, they can see people who've been successful and that's very inspiring and learn from their strategies, that, that's huge. And that's the majority of the trajectory. It's that end of it. Well, it's been a great evening, Sally, Dr. Sattel. I, I know that the, the, the crowd appreciates it. And in particular, I know we, we have, for instance, a, a dean sitting down near the front who's now relieved she doesn't have to close the psychology department. There really is a, <laughs> there's a whole lot of value there still. And uh, nobody's brain scan is going to take that away. Um, and um, uh, there's so much else we could have covered. I do recommend her books to you. There's a whole realm of, of quackery that, that we, didn't, uh, we didn't get into that you've, that you've taken a look at and, and illuminated. But um, uh, Dr. Sattel said to me uh, that, that uh, she, uh, having spent a long time in academe, but also more recently in, uh, in uh, Research Institute, that the one advantage she finds is she feels somewhat more free to speak her mind, and she sure did, didn't she? Thank you very much, Dr. Sattel, for being with us.